It's Entomology Animated, celebrating the amazing biology of insects using the power of digital animation. Ding! In this episode of Entomology Animated, we're going to look at the biology behind the painful sting of the red imported fire ant known as Solenopsis invicta. Okay, now if you ask me, Solenopsis invicta would be an awesome name for a death metal band. So let's take a closer look at the fire ant worker. Here's a 3D diagram of the basic anatomy. The gaster is where you'll find the stinger, which of course is the business end of the fire ant worker. When a worker attacks a person, she often bites with her mandibles so that she can hang on, while she injects venom into the skin using the stinger at the end of her gaster. Now I've created this 3D illustration which shows you where the stinger and the venom sac are within the gaster and their relationship to the major organs of the digestive tract. There's other stuff in the gaster, but I think this is the simplest way to kind of visualize the parts that are most important to our story, which is all about venom. So here's a model of Solenopsis invictus stinger in isolation. Bees, ants, and wasps are grouped together in the suborder Apocrita, and our stinging fire ant is grouped with the stinging wasps and bees under the suborder Aculeate Apocritans. The stingers of these insects adapted over the course of their evolution from an egg-laying mechanism, the ovipositor, into a venom-injecting syringe perfect for protecting the colony from giant clumsy vertebrates. The worker cast of Solenopsis invicta does not lay eggs, so the original ovipositor has been completely readapted into a weapon. Now how cool is that? But the stinger itself has other functions beyond just inflicting pain on intruders. In this model, the large red bulb is the venom sac where the ant stores its hate-filled cocktail of angry juice. Off to the side, you'll see Dufour's gland. This gland produces the trail pheromone. The worker uses her stinger to literally draw a trail of these pheromones on the ground, and the other colony members follow the trail, often to food sources, hence the famous lines of marching ants you often encounter in the wild. Okay, so here's where things get really interesting. The potent part of Solenopsis invicta venom is a necrotizing alkaloid, which is in fact called solenopsin. Here's a diagram of the basic chemical structure of solenopsin. Now, necrotizing means that it kills cells. Necrotizing is a fancy way of saying cell killing. The venom is also an alkaloid, meaning that it's a base. And you may recall from high school chemistry that a base is the opposite of an acid. Acids have a low pH, bases have a high pH. Now why is this interesting? Because the venom of a vast majority of other ant species are acidic. So at some point in the natural history of fire ants, the chemistry of their venom flipped to the other side of the pH scale. There are about 20 species of fire ants known to scientists. This is out of 12,000 known species of ants, by the way. And by comparing the level of alkalinity of uh, different fire ant venoms, scientists have another clue as to the origin of Solenopsis invicta. This combined with other methods such as genetics and morphology have helped scientists trace Solenopsis invicta back to South America. And by looking at the venom chemistry of the closest relatives of Solenopsis invicta, such as Solenopsis recteri, entomologists are putting together the story of the origin of the species Solenopsis invicta. So what else is interesting about this venom? Well, compared to other insect venoms, it is surprisingly low in proteins. Only about 0.1% of the venom is made up of proteins. Uh, compare the 0.1% protein concentration of fire ant venom to bee venom, which is made up of 10 to 12% in protein in dry weight. Why is that significant? Well, because it's the proteins within insect venom that cause allergic reactions in some people, and in some cases, this can be lethal. This model is the crystal structure Sol I3. It is one of four major allergens found in Solenopsis invicta venom. The red tube at the center is a diagrammatic way of just showing the basic backbone of the protein. The yellow blobs show the position of the atoms. Uh, protein structures are quite beautiful and their shape plays an important role in their function. A great place to learn more about these structures is the online protein databank at rcsb.org or the online protein viewer at aquaria.ws. The PDB ID for this particular protein is 2VZN. 
Since the protein content of Solenopsis Invicta venom is very low, allergic reactions are very rare, although one can develop an allergy to fire ant venom over time if one is stung fairly frequently. The venom also has antimicrobial and antifungal properties and is just as deadly to bacteria and fungal cells as it is to human cells. So fire ant venom has kind of a sterilizing quality. It has been suggested that the fire ants use their venom to keep the colony free from infection, although from what I've read, this has not been fully studied. And what else? Well, solenopsin has been found to be an inhibitor of angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the process where cancer cells hijack blood vessels in order to feed themselves as they grow into a tumor. Solenopsin has been synthesized in the lab by chemists, and cancer researchers have been studying it as a potential source of cancer treatment in people. Note that this does not mean that rolling around on a fire ant mound will cure you of cancer. It will relieve boredom in a big hurry, though. So what happens to you when you get stung? The venom is injected just below the skin as it comes in contact with your cells, represented here by simple orange bubbles. It causes a process known as lysis. The cell membrane ruptures and the contents of the cell spill out into the space between the cells. As the venom spreads, more cells rupture. Eventually macrophages and other parts of the immune system come in and clean up the area. This produces a bulging pustule just below the skin, which is pretty icky. Unless you're one of the very few people who are allergic to fire ant venom, this is not dangerous, it's just irritating. The pustule itself is usually free from bacteria because of the sterilizing quality of the venom. A real life fire ant attack usually involves hundreds or even thousands of ants, so the affected area could be covered with these pustules. When Solenopsis invicta battles another species of ant, the workers raise their stingers, extrude a droplet of venom, and wag their gasters back and forth, spraying venom all over the area. This is known as gaster flagging. The action produces a very faint squeaking noise as the body parts rub together. Well, I'm sad to say that is all the time I have for this episode. I hope you've enjoyed this odd little movie, and I hope you learned a few things in the process. There is so much, much more to talk about when it comes to Solenopsis invicta, and even more to talk about when it comes to ants, and then even more to talk about when it comes to insects. I hope to cover many more topics in future episodes. Here is a list of the references I used in making this particular episode. I would like to give a shout out to Seth Burgess for critiquing my ant model so that I can make it as accurate as possible. I'd like to thank E.O. Wilson for his inspiration and his input. I'd like to thank Walter Schenkel for his awesome book, The Fire Ants, and for answering my questions regarding stinger anatomy. And I'd like to thank Gail McGill, Campbell Strong, and the rest of the team at Digizyme for making Molecular Maya software, which allows me to bring the protein structures into my animation software, and also for their support. And I'd like to thank the great software developers at Pixelogic, Otoy, Autodesk, The Foundry, and of course, Adobe. Uh, most of all, I'd like to thank the scientists, biologists, and entomologists everywhere for their odd passion and dedication. Here is a list of just a few of the people who inspire me on a daily basis. 